Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the June Recreational Astronomy Night meeting online version of the Toronto Centre RESC. Uh, my name is Paul Markov. I'll be your host uh, for this evening, your virtual host, that is. I hope you're doing well and uh, have been able to take advantage of the continuing excellent skies we've had in, in the recent few weeks. Absolutely amazing weather and it's new moon too. Um, this is our third Recreational Astronomy Night meeting online and uh, I'd like to thank in advance our technical team that's comprised of Andrew and Betty Reed, Blake Nancaro, Ward Legro, and Ennio Cellucci. Uh, thank you guys for making this these online presentations possible. Um, the speakers for this evening are as follows. We have uh, Arnold Brody presenting the sky this month, followed by Blake Nancaro. He'll talk to us about building a custom dew heater. And uh, Dennis Gray will talk to us about rapid polar alignment. And uh, finally, our president, Ralph Chu, will wrap up the uh, online meeting uh, with uh, a few announcements. If you have questions, please enter them in the chat box, which is located at the right on the right side of the uh, video. And uh, we'll have Ennio read the uh, questions uh, out and so that speaker uh, can answer them. And uh, if uh, you're attending one of these meetings for the first time, whether you're a member or not, please let us know through the online chat. We'd like to keep track of any new folks uh, participating in our meetings. So without further ado, uh, let's get started with the sky this month presented by Arnold Brody. Thank you, Paul. And hi, everyone. For the sky this month, the month is actually the next four weeks until we have our next online meeting on July 15th. We'll take a look at some SpaceX news, some upcoming launches, and then we'll get into observing. Now, as everybody probably knows, the SpaceX Dragon Demo-2 carrying uh, veteran astronauts Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley took off from Florida on May 30 and docked with the ISS the next day. The Dragon was the first commercial spacecraft to carry astronauts to the, U uh, to the ISS and the first crewed space flight to launch from the U.S. since the shuttles were retired in uh, 2011. Bob and Doug named the capsule Endeavour, in part because they both took their first space flights aboard the retired space shuttle Endeavour. The Apollo 15 command module that orbited the moon in 1971 was also named Endeavour. Meanwhile, Boeing has decided to refly its Starliner passenger spacecraft without a crew this fall to dock at the ISS. They tried back in December, but that test failed when the Starliner had trouble reaching orbit, it consumed far too much fuel and didn't have enough to attempt a rendezvous, so they will try again this fall. Here are a couple of great shots by Reza Mohammed and Richard Prentice of Endeavour, the smaller dotter line and the ISS crossing the sky the night before Endeavour docked with the ISS. Four days ago, SpaceX launched 58 more Starlink satellites atop of Falcon 9, bringing the total launch so far to 540. The next 60 are scheduled for launch a week today. And SpaceX is developing a rocket called Starship that will launch up to 400 satellites at one time. In total, 12,000 Starlinks are planned for deployment with another 30,000 possible later on. Links from the first eight launches are so bright, they ruin scientific deep space imaging, as you can see here. Researchers may lose up to half of their images. SpaceX painted a Starlink dark gray to see if that would help. It's too dark to be seen naked eye, but it's still found in images of deep space, so that idea didn't work. So that the Starlinks in last week's launch wore sunshades. All future Starlinks will wear them too. They block all sunlights, so the uh, satellites are then invisible. And this might be a new problem for those monitoring stars for dips in magnitude. Basically, we're trading white lines for black lines. And SpaceX is not alone. 
others like Web One and Amazon and China too. They want to fill the sky with their own uh, internet beaming satellites. And I don't know if they're going to be bright or if they're going to be wearing sunshades. I don't know, but low Earth orbit is getting pretty full now. As for upcoming launches, a number have been rescheduled after the interruption caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Here are the next four, all, all in June, with launches in China, French Guiana, and two in Florida. A number of July launches have yet to be assigned dates, but one launch in July with a date is the United Arab Emirates Mars mission on July 14, with liftoff from Japan. Later in July, there will be launches to Mars, including NASA, Perseverance rover, and China's Tianwen-1 Mars lander. The Mars launch window uh, opens in July. You can go to spaceflight now to keep an eye on ILON, uh, keep an eye on the launch dates. So I'd like to now turn our attention to observing. The summer solstice is just days away and the year's nighttime hourglass is squeezed to its narrowest. And those of us near the 40th parallel have only three hours and 40 or so minutes of true night on or near solstice. Although the solstice has the shortest night, we can at least look forward to nights growing longer the rest of the year. By July 14, night is 40 minutes longer, but you can observe brighter double stars and planets during twilight. And for Mercury and Venus, you actually have to catch them in twilight. At the solstice, the sun will reach 69 degrees high at local noon at our latitude of 44 degrees. And Earth reaches its fullest from the sun on July 4, 152 million miles uh, kilometers away instead of the typical 150 average. And as of tonight and all of next week, we have dark skies with the new moon this coming weekend. And then a photogenic first quarter moon with the X and V occurs the following Sunday. The weekend after that, you can watch the full buck moon rising, so named because this time of year, buck deer antlers begin to grow. It's also called the thunder moon or the full hay moon. And then darker skies will eventually return by the end of that week. Throughout the summer, the darkest nights will be mid month. So now that we know when it will be dark, let's see what's happening with the solar system working our way out from the sun. Active regions associated with solar cycle 25 have been appearing on the sun over the last few months. And magnetogram images by the Solar Dynamics Observatory on the left, they show an active region with cycle 25 polarity. And if this cycle 25 activity continues unabated for six months, the NOAA will then say that cycle 24 ended six months earlier. In other words, the end of a cycle is determined after the fact. This new activity means the sun has become an interesting daytime target again with sunspots and prominences returning. Cycle 25 sunspots will appear in solar mid-latitudes event initially like the picture we see here. And they will drift up towards the equatorial region over the next 10 to 11 years, forming what is known as the butterfly diagram as seen here from the previous two solar cycles. Notice that the overlap of spots between the two, uh, that there is an overlap of spots from the two cycles, so there is no clear break between them. This renewed activity and like, uh, and with, and with it a likely increase in solar flares, that means we could be seeing more auroras again, like this display captured by Silu Nemina up at the CAO a couple of years ago. If you'd like to receive aurora alerts in your inbox, visit the NOAA subscription service page and register for the alerts that you want. As you can see here, I'm registered for space weather advisories, which come every week and on any day if something significant occurs. An example of an advisory email is on the right in which there was nothing happening at the time. I'm sure that's gonna change pretty soon. On to the moon. On June 28, we can see or image the Lunar X 
which is a result of sunlight and shadows on the rims of the Blancinus, Lacaye, and Purbach craters. The X is visible for a few hours just before first quarter, slightly below the moon's equator. At the same time, a lunar V can be spotted further north up the Terminator. It's the result of sunlight and shadows involving Euchert Crater and a few other small ones. In the middle diagram, the yellow dots show where and when the lunar limb is tilted at its maximum towards us due to libration. On July 4, we have a good opportunity to explore the circular Mare Smithy peeking around the moon's eastern limb. And at perigee, the angular size of the moon is almost not quite, but close to 10 degrees larger than at apogee. Well, there are some interesting moon events over the next four weeks, starting in just two days. If the pre-dawn sky is clear on Friday, and I think it will be, we can catch a thin crescent moon and a similarly thin crescent Venus rising only 10 arc minutes apart for those of us in the Toronto area. Both can fit within a telescope's low power field or in binoculars, and high magnification of Venus shows its crescent phase imitating the moon, which makes sense since the sun-moon observer angle is essentially identical to the sun-Venus observer angle. So it would make sense they would both have the same phase. Now, if you intend to photograph the pair, please be sure to position an umbrella or other shade to block the nearby rising sun for safety. The moon will actually occult Venus for observers in Eastern Canada and north of a line running through Europe and Asia. Here's a close-up showing the occultation zone in Eastern Canada, Eastern New York, and the New England states. Between these two yellow lines, the moon will rise with Venus behind it, and you can then watch Venus reappear in daylight. Visit the IOTA website for the timings where you live. And now two days after that, an annular eclipse sweeps across southern Asia, northern India, and eastern to central Africa on Sunday. The moon's angular size will be just a little bit too small to completely cover the sun, resulting in a ring of fire in the sky. We can expect live streaming of the eclipse. Uh, we can check out YouTube for those. And if you catch it, it'll probably be around midnight our time, depending on where exactly along the eclipse path the uh, broadcast originates. On June 29, the moon occults 95 Virginis, magnitude 5.5, it occurs around midnight, depending on your location. The timings shown in this animation are for my home in Whitby, east of Toronto. For those living further west, the occultation happens earlier. And there will be a partial penumbral lunar eclipse on the night of Saturday, July 4, and into Sunday at the time shown here. Now, penumbral eclipses of the moon are very hard to detect. There's not that much darkening. And the previous full moon in June also underwent a partial penumbral eclipse as the moon passed through Earth's northern penumbral shadow. In between these two near misses of the Earth's umbra, the new moon of June 21 crosses the ecliptic right on the node on the opposite side of the sky, of course, producing the annular eclipse we just talked about. On to the planets. Looking down from above the sun's north pole, we see the relative positions of the inner four planets as of tonight. If we treat this white line as the horizon for our stargazers, the sun is about to rise. They can see Mars up fairly high, so it must have been up for hours, and Venus appears very close to the horizon, having just risen before the sun does. It's now about an hour later and stargazers on the other side of Earth have just watched the sun set and for them, Mercury is visible low in the west, about to set soon itself. And here are the inner planets on July 14. 
Mercury has traveled about a third of its orbit to the other side of the sun from our perspective. Now all three inner solar system planets are visible during some part of the night or pre-dawn. Let's take a closer look. As we just saw, Mercury is visible very low in the west after sunset tonight. Its orbit is taking Mercury to inferior conjunction. It will pass between us and the sun on June 30. Now, if you have an unobstructed or elevated view to the west, you can pick out the magnitude 2.2 speck of light in binoculars after sunset the next couple of days. But do wait for the sun to set before trying, of course. By this time next month, Mercury has swung to the other side of the sun from our point of view and is now rising in the pre-dawn spot than it was back on June 17 because it is slightly higher on this date and hence further from the sun and around twice as bright. As we just saw, whoops, I went the wrong way, sorry. Venus just finished a great show as the evening star this past winter and spring, and now it's west of the sun, what we call the morning star, and for the next four weeks, it will be climbing higher. Tomorrow morning, Venus will be just 6% illuminated, but a brilliant magnitude negative 4.3 because it's relatively close to us, giving us a larger surface area. It's almost a full arc minute in size, uh, uh, over 50 uh, arc seconds. By July 14, Venus has come close to the ANSI of its orbit, which it will reach on August 12, and has dropped an angular size to about half an arc minute, though slightly brighter at minus 4.5. This would be a good time to try taking an image of the thin crescent, especially when our atmosphere is calm before dawn. With luck, you might capture the crescent Venus like Rick Foster did on May 13 when it was still east of the sun. This, this image is all the more impressive when you consider the turbulent air close to the, to the horizon that uh, Rick had to deal with. Well done. Now on to Mars. In mid-June, Mars rises around 1.30 in the morning, climbing to around 30 degrees high in the southeast by the end of astronomical twilight, which occurs around 4 a.m. In the pre-dawn, the air is typically very calm having had all night to settle down, providing good seeing needed for planetary detail. And being 30 degrees up, Mars is above much of the obscuring atmosphere, improving our chances of seeing it hold steady. Now, the amount of atmosphere we look through depends on the altitude of the object we're viewing. With Mars 30 degrees up, we're looking through two air masses about one third less than when just 20 degrees up. That's why it's so important for plants to rise above 20 degrees to get a opportunity for a decent look. We are at the start of the great, opposite, uh, the great operation of Mars for 2020, and we will come very close to Mars at its opposition in October. Over the next four weeks, Mars drifts one hour of right ascension from Aquarius to Cetus. And as of the 14th of July, Mars will be 13 arc seconds wide, getting brighter now at negative 0.7 magnitude and 85% illuminated. These are photos of Mars taken by fellow club members during the last approach in opposition of Mars in 2018. They have been posted on our forum astrophotography section where you can read more about them. As for observing Mars, you will want to use as much magnification as your telescope and local conditions uh, will allow. Now, rule of thumb is a telescope can theoretically uh, achieve 50 times magnification per inch of aperture. So if you have a four inch scope, you can push it to 200 X. Uh, if you have, um, an eight inch, you could push it to 400 X. And you may try using an eyepiece that achieves your maximum theoretical magnification for your scope uh, because Mars will be up high in the pre-dawn sky when the air should be steady. And so give it a try. And if it is steady, you'll get some great views. 
Otherwise, you may have to back off to a lower power eyepiece. And using color filters can enhance certain features. Orange increases contrast between light and dark features, and that will also penetrate hazes and most clouds. Yellow brightens desert regions and darkens bluish and brownish features. Red enhances fine details on the surface by darkening the non-red areas. And light green enhances frost patches and polar caps. Finally, blue shadow, uh, blue filters may show you clouds and limb haze. So if you have these color filters or decide to get them to maximize your viewing of Mars this summer, remember you can also use them uh, for viewing Jupiter and Saturn as well. Mars passed through its equinox in April, autumn for the north, spring for the south. Its southern hemisphere is tipping towards the sun and us now. Maximum tilt, the start of summer for southern Mars, occurs on September the 2nd. So as we observe Mars this year, we will be watching its south polar cap shrink. On our way to the gas giants of the outer solar system, we pass through the asteroid belt where five of the brightest are approaching opposition, namely Alet, Antigone, Lydia, Herculina, and Palais. And here are the paths they will take across our sky the next four weeks. The location, date, and magnitude at opposition are marked for each of the asteroids. I think the brightest one is um, Herculina. It reaches 9.5. And here's an example of how, Hercule how far Herculina travels at opposition. The field of view here is about one half a degree. And if both of those nights are clear, and if you take images of that area, you could try your own blink test to find the asteroid leader. Now we've reached the outer solar system. And here are the positions of the gas giants as of tonight and two dots next to the sun, showing Earth's position tonight and on July 14. Here's a horizon line like we used earlier with the inner solar system. For those on the night side of Earth, all four outer planets are visible, at least for some portion of the night. And here's another line representing the location, uh, I should say the horizon, for people watching the sunset in their western sky on July 14th. If they turn around and look east, they will see Jupiter rising. In other words, Jupiter will be rising at opposition that night, rising as the sun sets, with Saturn to follow a week later. Jupiter rises at 1047 tonight, so after the show, you can get outside and take a peek. And it will cross the meridian six and a half hour later at 3.17 in the morning when the sun is still 17 degrees below the horizon, so still quite dark. At that hour, our sky should be calm, having settled down all night, and that should give us good seeing so we can pick out details in Jupiter's cloud bands or capture excellent photos like the one here by Rick Foster. As for colored filters, a rule of thumb is to choose a filter with a color opposite that of the feature you want to see. So to enhance the great red spot and the reddish brown equatorial bands, you can try a blue filter. Blue filters block some of the red, darkening the red spot and the equatorial bands so they stand out in greater detail. In larger telescope or in greater contrast, I meant to say. In larger telescopes, a red filter can bring out projections and festoons along the edge of the equatorial belts and a light yellow filter may enhance the polar regions. It takes Jupiter 10 hours to rotate, so there's an opportunity to observe where time lapse record its rotation at or near opposition. But being summertime, we only have a few hours of nights, so we can only catch part of that rotation. Shadow transit across Jupiter by its large Galilean moons are fun to observe, even image. Here's a depiction of how the transit of Io and its shadow will appear at 1 a.m. Eastern time on June 30. Cal Sky predicts the great red spot will transit that morning at 2 a.m. So I doctored this image 
to place the GRS where it should be at 1 a.m. Jupiter will be 22 degrees up then, so we're going to need some good seeing for a decent view or astrophoto. And here's Jupiter's retrograde path as Earth overtakes it in our race around the sun. The upper left oval shows where Jupiter is tonight. The one in the center is where it will be at opposition. And it's interesting to note that when at opposition, it is halfway between the extremes of its retrograde path. And here's a special bonus for anyone with a 10 inch or larger telescope a chance to spot Pluto with Jupiter's help. Jupiter and Pluto had three conjunctions this year due to Jupiter's retrograde motion. The second of the three occurs on the night of Monday, June 29, and on through midnight when both planets are at right ascension, 19 hours and 44 minutes, shown here. The declination lines in the grid are 10 arc seconds apart. So if you have a 10 inch or larger telescope on an equatorial mount without go to, you can try spotting Pluto, which reflects sunlight at a feeble magnitude, 14.3. First, center Jupiter in a high power eyepiece, then slew south 40 arc seconds. Pluto is now in your field of view, but it will be low and it will be faint so I wish you good luck in finding it. On to Saturn. Saturn rises tonight at 11.04, just 17 minutes behind Jupiter, and crosses the meridian 17 minutes behind Jupiter as well, around 3.44, with the sun still very low. So it will be a good opportunity, uh, again, with steady air that we should have uh, in the early morning hours, and it will give us sharp views of the planet and its rings. And maybe you'd like to give sketching a try. The rings are tilted around 21 degrees to our line of sight, nearly hiding the Southern Pole. This summer and fall, the tilt increases another one and a half degrees, almost completely hiding the Southern limb. And the diameter of the outer A ring is 2.6 times that of Saturn itself. So when Saturn reaches its greatest angular size of 18 arc seconds around opposition, the rings will extend 43 arc seconds, almost as wide as Jupiter at 45. And here is Saturn's path in the sky. It's also going through retrograde now. And the uh, portion of Jupiter's path that is in, in this image, I, I colored it blue to be less confusing. And here we see the position and appearances of Uranus and Neptune on July through my reporting period. Uh, these planets rise in the morning, uh, Neptune around 1.15 and Uranus at 3 a.m. Uh, that's the beginning of astronomical twilight and neither planet reaches the meridian during nighttime. So this is not a good time to see it. Um, Neptune reaches opposition in September and Uranus a month later. So late summer and early fall will be the prime time for viewing these little blue dots. Moving on to comets, of the eight brightest comets listed in the skylive.com, only two are up during the night in the northern hemisphere at this time. C 2017 T2 and C 2019 Y1. The other six are currently visible from the Southern Hemisphere and some will cross the ecliptic and become visible in the North. I suggest you visit the skylive.com slash comets if you wanna stay current on these bright comets and find out when some of those may be crossing uh, the sky coming North. The two comets that we see here are fading. A large aperture, moderate to large aperture telescope would help. Of the two, um, the pan stars is still uh, fairly bright at 9.0, so you may be able to catch that without too much trouble. There are no meteor showers at this time. 
The next one is the Southern Delta Aquarids uh, in late July. And on to deep space. Here's our sky four nights from now on the new moon Sunday at 1130, the true start of night. Now, this would be your last weekend for targeting the galaxies in the Virgo, Leo, Coma Berenices area until next spring. And west of the meridian are a handful of globular clusters. Messier's 5, 3, and 53 are all high up, providing excellent views. Even higher are globular clusters M13 and M92 as they pass overhead, touching the zenith or nearly so giving you a chance to observe or photograph these dense balls of stars through only one air mass. Like Silu did when taking this detailed image of M13 up at our Sioux Laura Observatory last June. And here's the sky looking south on the night of July 1415, when Sagittarius and the Milky Way's nucleus crossed the meridian at the start of night. The Sagittarius arm of the Milky Way, you can see it rising here from the nucleus and stretching overhead up through Cygnus the Swan and on to Cassiopeia. This is prime time for the globular clusters that form a halo around the Milky Way's nucleus and treasures of all kind that are embedded along the Milky Way, such as planetary nebula like M27, the Dumbbell Nebula found in Volticula, Emission and reflection nebulae like the Lagoon Nebula, six degrees north of the spout of the teapot, and the Trifid Nebula, 1.2 degrees further north, or open clusters like M29 and Cygnus, or double stars like colorful Albireo, or the challenging double-double Epsilon Lyrae that are barely separated here in this photo. You, you will have actually a good opportunity to try splitting the double-double because they are passing very close to the zenith uh, this month. And uh, so you're looking through, again, just one air mass to try and split them. And I think it's a bit ironic that all of this wealth of deep sky objects are up during the shortest nights of the year. But at least it's not frigidly cold. As you wage your battle with biting insects while trying to enjoy the stars this summer, you might want to be on the lookout for bugs in space. I have four for you, starting with Caldwell 19, the Cocoon Nebula, and the Mission Nebula surrounding newborn stars. Found in Cygnus, flying high in the east, magnitude 7.2 and 20 arc minutes wide. Not quite as big as the full moon. It's 2,500 light years away. The second is a very faint and it may be difficult to find. It's NGC 63, I'm sorry, 6537, the Red Spider Nebula, although spiders are arachnids, not insects, I know. But found in Sagittarius, it is magnitude 13. So that's going to need a large telescope to see optically. It's probably best captured by camera. A companion star or maybe it's magnetic field lines that are forcing the expanding nebula to to take on that two-lobed shape. The third is the Bug Nebula in Scorpius, also known as NGC 6302. It's sometimes called the Butterfly Nebula, but I'm saving that name for the next slide. It's a bipolar planetary nebula. It may be a challenge due to its low declination. For us, it only reaches about seven degrees high at best. An elevated viewing location will help. Aim your telescope four degrees west of Lambda Scorpii, the scorpion stinger. The bug will look like a slender, fuzzy streak in a 150 millimeter telescope and more like an hourglass in scopes 200 millimeters and up. The second, I'm sorry, I did that again. I'm sorry. The final bug in space is the butterfly nebula embedded in IC 1318 also known as the Seder region in Cygnus. It rides very high in the sky this summer. There is at least one other butterfly nebula, NGC 2346, but that is currently lost in the sun's glare in Monoceros. IC 1318 lies 
850 light years away and glows weakly at magnitude 14.9. This is definitely an astro imaging challenge. Well executed in this image of the Seder region by Adrian Aberdeen. I would like to thank our club members listed here on the left for their astro photos. They are excellent. And that's a wrap, Paul. Um, Enio, are there any questions? So we have one question from Eric Briggs. Is Arnold using Starry Night? There's a text file in Starry Night that can be used to update the great red spot positions to keep it current. Uh, yes, uh, as you see on the right, I was using uh, Starry Night Pro, both six and eight, Stellarium and Virtual Moon Atlas to help with the images in the show. Uh, thank you for the tip on uh, updating, and I'll try that to see if it works. And while the question was answer answered in the chat, um, Ashita, pa <coughs> pardon me, Parek is asking, is it possible to see the Milky Way this month from the Long Sioux area near Toronto? I think so. Um, I have seen it from Long Sioux. I've also seen it on a very good night from Glen Major Forest. So I think if you get out, uh, and if it's a, a dry night with no haze, that would help a lot. Uh, then yes, I, I believe you will be able to see it. And Eric adds to his question, the file is called jupitergrs.txt. Thank you. Okay. Got any more questions, Anya? That's it for now. That's it. All right, perfect. So um, thank you very much, Arnold, for a very thorough presentation. Well done, and I appreciate you taking the time to, to prepare for this and then sharing it with us. Thank you so much. Well, thank um, you, too. All right. Um, I think we're ready to move on to our next speaker. But first, yes, first, we need a quick break to set up. We'll be right back. And we're back. Our next speaker is Blake Nancaro. He'll talk to us about building a costume dew heater for your telescope lens. Thank you, Paul. Uh, my name is Blake, and it's my objective to share with you how to build um, a, a dew heating strap. Uh, if you want to do astronomy in Canada, you, you need dew heaters. If uh, you want to do astronomy for a protracted period of time, you want to do visual or photographic work, you, you need dew heaters. Some people think you only need dew heaters in the summer. No, you need them all year round. <laughs> Anytime you have high humidity, uh, it, uh, that, that's going to be uh, an issue. Amazingly, from my backyard, I haven't had to run the dew heaters for the last three or four nights, just because the daytime humidity is low and the temperature is not falling terribly low. But if if you have um, the temperature dropping low and you're getting close to at 
or below the dew point, then you're you're going to need dew heaters. Um, and and let me say right away, I just want to apologize in advance to Mr. Jim Kendrick. <laughs> uh, I need to make some disclaimers here. I'm assuming you know which end of a soldering iron to hold. Uh, and if you do undertake some of the things that I'm suggesting, that you're not going to sue us if you bur burn up your telescope or or your your workroom. I, uh, I I do want to caution you. There are some risks here. If you don't do your math right, you you could have a heating element that goes red hot or white hot, and and that could burn stuff, set things on fire. You could burn yourself. Uh, there, there's a possibility. I think the risk is a bit low, assuming that there's fuses in place, but you might damage your controller for your dew heating system. So, so be careful um, here. And I'll emphasize later when you're doing the math, you know, do some double checking and testing and so on. But, uh, and, and if you don't know what you're doing, if uh, I hope you'll You'll ask if you're not confident. Um, uh, people will help on our our forums. Uh, there, there's uh, at the end of this presentation, I've got some contact information. You can reach out to me, and I'll try to answer your questions um, for you. So here we go. Why why do you want to do this? Um, I I have two inch do do heaters uh, uh, from Kendrick uh, Astronomy. Uh, in based in Toronto, uh, I, I've had several of them, in fact, and and I've gone through a number of them. They have broken or failed. The, in general, I think the build quality of these products is good, but I wonder if you know they're just not robust for how a, a lot of us use them. If you have a permanent observatory and you're you know, putting dew heaters on the telescope and they stay there for months or years, great. There, there shouldn't ever be any problem with those. But I think about when I'm doing observing and I take the two inch heater off of one eyepiece, put it on another one, and then change eyepieces again. So I take the dew heater off and put it on another one. E even though I'm trying to be careful, I'm trying to be gentle with it, I'm trying not to bend it or crimp it or things like that. And, and when I store it in the case, I coil it up very gently. I make sure it's not being pinched or compressed or anything. And I'm trying to be really careful, but they they keep breaking on me. Um, and, and I think inside them, there's some very fine wires that, that are maybe brittle or just can fail over time if they're bent the wrong way. So uh, it, it, that that was sort of part of the, the issue for me that I recently ran into a problem again with one of my dew heaters. In fact, it was on uh, an observing session uh, about 18 months ago in the backyard. It was cold. That's not my telescope, um, but but I had very cold conditions and there was some frost on the telescope at, and the eyepiece kept fogging up. And I had the dew heater wrapped around it and I thought it was working okay. And I took my hand out of my glove, my hand was cold and I felt the dew heater and it kind of felt like it was working. It wasn't ice cold, um, but I, it didn't feel really warm either. So but to make a long story short, I tested it and I found it was intermediate. It worked in a certain position and not in others. So I, I knew there was a bad heating wire or necrom wire inside it. So, and again, it, it, this is not the first time this has happened to me. So I was frustrated and, and uh, I needed a, a solution. But I, I, have, I uh, have some talent. I, uh, I had almost all of the supplies that I, I thought I would need. In fact, I've been collecting for years Necrom wire from various sources. I'll, I'll talk about so that in a bit where, where you can find Necrom wire. And, and uh, over the years, I've looked at various designs that I've found on the internet and uh, sort of bookmarked a few of those, kept track of them. But I was greatly inspired by a particular design by an amateur astronomer who lives in the Philippines. Um, I, I went looking for his website recently and, and the, 
he, I think he redid his blog or he redid his website. So I couldn't find a bunch of things. Now I couldn't find his article in particular and I, so I don't have a link for it, but at the time I took the pictures, uh, I thought it was really interesting, his design. So do you see what's going on um, here in the, this top image that there's this plastic thing that forms kind of the core of the heater. And he explained that he got that plastic from uh, just a file folder. He'd gone to a stationary store, he bought a file folder, plastic type. You can see it's sort of clear, translucent. Um, and he just cut it into a strip. So, so I thought, hey, that's a good idea. Plastic core, that'll work nicely as long as it stands up to the heat. Uh, so that that's good. And you can see that there's wire wrapped around it in this zigzag pattern. If you look closely, that's heating element wire and nichrome wire. And his wire is pretty fine there. And if I remember correctly, nichrome wire is brittle. Um, so you, you don't want to bend it back and forth a lot. It, it might snap. Anyway, I like that design. But it, what I didn't like is all the electrical tape that he put on it. Um, here, I thought, you know, after after a while, I know that stuff gets sticky and gooey and maybe starts to move around or slide a little bit. So, but, but the reason he did that is he wanted to sort of to get the wires locked down. You don't want those moving around because you could get a short circuit and that could change the heating output for this. So I was a little bit nervous about that if I was going to mimic this. I came up with an idea for sort of getting around on that. Uh, so he, here's here's what I did. Um, I uh, I took a plastic piece, um, clear sort of light blue plastic, and and do you see the notches that are in here? I put notches every little while, and that's meant to hold the wire in place with, without using big blobs of electrical tape all over the place. Uh, so I, I that that was just an idea that popped into my head. This sawtooth kind of design, um, and and I even thought of another way to do that. You could have a hole and a slit in the plastic to kind of capture the, the wire in place. There'd be no way that it could move then. The, the wire that I've put around this is under some tension. So I do not think that the wires are going to hop out of their grooves um, at all. So I'm not worried about short circuits with, with this. Uh, so so I, I was quite pleased with this sort of approach or this design. Um, and and uh, Edeny's design, in, again, I found very inspiring because I thought it's re it's a really flexible system. And and I don't know if you can make out the wire that I'm using here, but it's kind of crimped. It's it's a, a kind of a wavy line. And I'll explain why shortly why, why it looks that way. Uh, but it, I just I know that this wire is really really flexible, so I'm not worried about it breaking. It's quite heavy, robust wire. Uh, so so I, I'm sort of happy with this approach. My friend Rhonda um, gave me a great idea for the plastic core. And uh, in a moment of inspiration, I realized um, that I had something that I could use to, to make a casing that would provide insulation. Obviously, you don't want these metal wires touching any metal on your telescope. They, they have to be protected or insulated. So, so now the math part. Sorry if you don't like doing this bit, um, but uh, if, if you do want to build your own dew heater, there's a few things that you need to know you're going to need to perform. So you need to know your heat target, how much power you're trying to produce or output. You, you need to have a, a, a pretty good idea how long the heating element or nichrome wire needs to be and uh, you, you need to know the resistance of that wire and sort of take take all those things um, together. Uh, um, so I, I looked at a bunch of dew heaters that are out there that are small for two inch eyepieces or three inch eyepieces or camera lenses and, and looked at some of the different vendors that make them. And I found that they were producing anywhere from three and a half to 10 watts. Uh, so, so that was sort of a target um, for me. Um, now you need to know your electronic theory forums, um, he, uh, uh, sorry, formula um, here. So 
So the voltage is squared and the P is the power, your heat target, and that'll tell you the resistance that you need. And of course, I'm driving all of this, you know, the classic sort of thing with telescope accessories off of 12 volts. So 12 volts squared over the power rating. I, I just kind of chose a number in between. I thought, hey, I'm going to go with uh, 9 watts. So that means that the target resistance that I needed, 16 ohms. Now you got to be careful with this because you've got a power calculation here and you're doing division. So small changes in some of these numbers can make for big changes in other ones. So again, you want to be careful here when you're doing the math so that you don't light anything on fire um, that you don't intend to. Uh, uh, then I needed to figure out the length of wire that I needed. You saw that plastic piece that I made and I had the sawtooth in it and, and I put those notches in the plastic every 15 millimeters. I just randomly decided on that. And then that produced this zigzag pattern for the wire. Uh, and, and I counted the diagonals and the verticals. I had 16 of each. So that meant as I wrapped the, wrapped the wire around, I needed a total run length of 85 centimeters of wire. So now I, I had another important number. I had the OM rating. I had the amount of wire that I needed. And then I went to my supply. I had a lot of resistive heating wire. And some of it was rated at 44 ohms per meter. And some of it was down to 7.3 ohms per meter. I chose a piece of wire that was 25.8 ohms per meter. And of course I needed 85 centimeters of that. So 85% of that gave me an ohm rating of 22, 22 ohms. I bench tested that uh, 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 before sort of building the whole thing um, and, and put it on my controller and hooked it up to the battery and turned it on full power. And it was, it was good. Um, uh, I was able to hold the heater, didn't burn my fingers. Um, I, I didn't set my desk on fire. There was no new super, supernova in our solar system that couldn't be explained. So it was, the, it was a good sort of uh, uh, test. So I knew my math was all good. Uh, so I had sort of everything that I needed in terms of the resistive wire. Uh, again, Rhonda, um, uh, gave me the idea for the plastic core that was like fantastic. I was explaining the project and see I needed some plastic and I was thinking that I would go down to the dollar store and buy a few plastic file folders. And she said, here, and she handed me a sparkle empty bottle of sparkling water. Um, uh, this light blue sort of color. It was a really nice size. I knew it would fit uh, a, a fairly large eyepiece. Uh, I don't know if any of you have those Teleview uh, eyepiece hand grenades, um, huge uh, eyepieces, but I, I have some modest size two inch eyepieces, so it would work well for that. I've got some camera lenses that maybe have uh, uh, seven, eight, uh, nine uh, centimeter diameters. Uh, so I, I needed something that would work in all of those kinds of different applications, but this bottle was perfect. So I just cut a, a, a slice of that out, two and a half centimeters wide, and um, uh, it, a, a neat thing about it is it was pre-curved. It was in the shape or the sort of the pattern um, that I wanted. So I was really, really happy about that and, and free. <laughs> so that was good. It was headed for the recycle bin. Um, I have done this for many years. Um, not, nothing terribly lately, but uh, I harvested a lot of toasters. And I took the heating or the resistive wire out of the toasters. That's that's where that crimped wire came from that you saw in my earlier photo. Um, so if you've got an old toaster, it's dead. You can use that. I don't need my hair dryer anymore, so I, I took the heating elements out of those. A lot of hair dryers have coiled um, resistive wire, so that won't necessarily work for a dew heater application. But you might you be able to use it for other projects. And of course, you can buy this stuff. Um, from electronic shops. Um, uh, I bought some somewhere and I've totally forgotten where I got it, but I got a good sort of length and it was about $2 per meter. And, and if you buy it from a store or you buy it online, you can pick the 
resistive power rating or resistance that you want. So I started putting stuff together. Again, there's a snapshot of the plastic core. I've got my tape measure to hold it down because it wants to curl up into the uh, original circle. It's got the memory in the plastic. Um, I wrap the toaster heater wire around it. And then another sort of moment of inspiration kind of thing that happened for the project is I realized that when I was out at the shed looking at a flat tire on my bicycle that a bicycle tube would maybe be the perfect size and of course offer very good insulation. I have two bikes. I have a racer that's got tires that are less than one inch um, but the mountain bike tire or tube size one and three eighths of an inch tire size was was great. That was a really good size and fit around the plastic, forming this uh, very good sheath and offered a bit of structural s stability um, to this as well. So, so that that was good. Um, you you need to get power to the heater, so I wanted a cord that was uh, pretty flexible. Um, years ago, I was at Active Surplus down on Queen Street, the orange store with the gorilla, and I I bought a long length of uh, speaker uh, cable and I, I can't remember if it's two conductor or four conductor um, but it's got this great jacket on it it's really a uh, nice soft rubber it's very flexible and cold so obviously you need two conductor wire um, to get the power up to the heater uh, I have found with the stock or commercial dew heaters the power cords are a little bit short sometimes they're not quite long enough or or there's the danger of uh, stressing um, or snagging a cable. So I deliberately made the power cable a little bit longer, about one and a half meters. You could use lamp cord. You could use speaker wire. That would be fine. You just need to make sure it's a good gauge. You, you don't want to use really fine, thin wire. You want to use a, a large gauge because you, you don't want any heat produced in the wire. You just want to transfer all that power um, as effectively as possible. Uh, all this stuff, I had all this in my part bins. So I, I actually didn't have to go out and buy anything to make this uh, this dew heater, including the little bits and bobs. You, you, if you're plugging into a standard uh, dew heater controller, you need um, an RCA connector, RCA jack, um, uh, sorry, an RCA plug to do that. And then there's various supplies, electrical tape and stuff. Uh, another little thing that I did is I put aluminum foil inside the dew heater so that it forms a reflector. It's on the back or the outside edge. So I'm just trying to keep a little bit of energy directed back towards the eyepiece. And I made a fabric cover um, for that. So, so there's a few dollars uh, there. Maybe if you had to go out and buy all these parts, maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 dollars you're looking at all told again for me I had everything so I didn't sort of spend a dime it was just what a, my time need some tools here of course for this I used uh, various tools that I've noted here um, again hopefully it's clear you, you want to be um, careful about the math so uh, you need an ohm meter or a digital multimeter you, you can do an additional check and, and use an amp amperage meter as well make sure it's uh, at the proper power rating because you might producing be producing seven eight nine ten amps of power that's a lot um so, so you want to be careful and i sparked up the sewing machine um at the end to make the cover uh, for this and there it is all done um you, you can see i've got the fabric cover in immediately below the fabric cover is the uh, bicycle inner tube um, that's around the plastic sheath. The, the plastic core has the wire around it. On the outer surface of the bicycle tube, um, there's a, a piece of aluminum foil, again, acting as a reflector. Uh, there, there's my microphone cable and an RCA plug. And if you're wondering what the white thing is here, that's just a twist eye. Um, when you buy the commercial dew heaters, they, they usually have an elastic band and Velcro or hook and loop um, that's being used to enclose it or lock it in place. Um, I, you know, I thought about that, but but I decided not to go that route. All the times that I've used this dew heater to date, I've just snapped an elastic band around it 
and that's been fine. But I found a really long twist tie, um, so that that will work as well. Um, so lot, lots of um, things here. The final, it, it's all but done. The final thing that I need to do is just hand sew um, just in this area. And I'm gonna put a few threads through the plastic or the rubber sheath there of the power cable to, just to lock everything in place. But it's done, it works, it works really well. I'm really happy with it. And again, for me, it, it didn't cost anything. So if you're not a do-it-yourselfer, if you're nervous about um, any of these steps, if the math is unclear to you, I strongly recommend visiting our local Toronto astronomy accessory vendor, Kendro, Kendrick uh, Astro Instruments, and the two-inch heater is uh, around $71 Canadian. I looked at the, the website just recently, so those are the prices as of now. Um, Kendrick used to make an a kind of an economy series called the Firefly Heaters, but I, I don't see those on the the website anymore. So I think those are discontinued. And you can see by the website snapshot that they've actually dropped the prices for the premier heaters. So they're a bit less expensive than they used to be. So again, apologies to Jim Kendrick. I'm not trying to undercut anybody, but for me, I'm, I'm doing multitasking. I've, I've got my Kendrick eight inch dew heater for my big telescope. I've got the Kendrick controller that drives that. Um, I used to have a Kendrick uh, two inch eyepiece that's dead doesn't work anymore so I've made my own and and if I want to run my camera at the same time I need I need another dew heater so I'm going to build a couple of these um, to use for my eyepiece and my camera lens it, if you have a, if you have an imaging rig you need a heater for your objective or for your secondary meter you need one for your guide scope maybe one for your finder as well so so invariably we need two three four heaters maybe if you're really serious about this and you want heaters for your binoculars, you need four right there for the binoculars. So it's kind of amazing when you start to add it all up, how many that, that you need. I've made all the information about my build, detailed information available on my website. I list all the uh, supplies and parts and consumables in detail and I explain all, sort of all the steps. Um, and I have links to my specific blog site um, blog articles that have photos and detailed information there. So it's kind of an online how-to guide. Um, if, if you use that website URL, that'll take you to the, the article with all the detailed build information. If you have a QR code reader on your phone, you can scan that code. It will take you to that, that article. Again, apologies to Jim. He's a nice guy. He's helped me out a lot. Um, but uh, if you're on a budget, if you need lots of dew heaters, if your uh, current dew heater has broken or failed, um, or you need more to do multitasking, um, and you are good with a soldering iron and uh, you've got some of these electronic bits around, um, then you might be able to make some pretty uh, pretty easy. So thanks for your time. Um, I don't don't know. I have no idea how much time I took. So, but uh, if we can. If we have time for questions now, I'm happy to take those. I've got my email address there. So if you have a follow-up question after, I'm happy to do that. I hope that you can keep, keep your telescope uh, nice and warm, but not too hot. Uh, and that uh, that will help you observe all, all night long or image all night long. Thanks. Thank you, Blake. Let's go to some questions. Ennio, do we have any? So we have a comment from Eric who <coughs> writes, Protection of dew is important, but a heater, in my humble opinion, is not your first line of defense. A dew cap uses no electricity, has no wires, and baffles straight light. That's the thing. Reduces reliance on heater. Yeah, um, uh, I have I have a dew shield, um, and uh, the my uh, finder scope has an integrated shield and uh, when you use a Newtonian telescope you kind of have built-in shielding for the primary mirror uh, and if you have a 
camera lens with a hood, a, an extendable um, hood, that all that helps. And there's a rule of thumb when you have a dew shield that it should be at least 1.5 times uh, the diameter of the telescope tube. So if you have an eight inch telescope and you put a dew shield on it, the dew shield should extend out uh, uh, 12, 12 inches, right? Or more. Um, I put a, a, a foam wraps around a telescope um, to serve as dew shields. Uh, I, I've used a cardboard, uh, a thin cardboard to wrap around a telescope, snap an elastic band on it, acts as a dew shield. So that's great. Um, and again, no muss and fuss in terms of electricity or power. But there have been many a time where even when I've done that, I've been wiped out after a couple of hours. Uh, a place that comes to mind is just about every time that I went to Mew Lake in Algonquin and we observed beside the beach, of course, then we're asking for trouble, but, but uh, every time that I was at the park observing in September, we, people were getting dewed out and I needed my shield and my dew eaters and I had the dew eaters running at full blast. And the, the shields that we're talking about uh, are a great idea and may keep the dew, the dew at bay, but that's only working at the front of the telescope. So my whole thing here was about um, an eyepiece heater where, you know, if you, if you, um, if that's exposed for any sort of amount of time uh, to a humid, say, summer evening, uh, it, it's going to do up. And, and I have found in the winter time that eyepieces get so cold that the heat and moisture from my eye and my face make the, the eyepiece fog up. And I can't stand that when there's fog on the eyepiece. That's just drives me crazy. So I think with respect that, that uh, in extremely high humidity situations, when you're very near or at the dew point, a dew cap will only do so much and putting covers on an eyepiece or covers on the finder um, are, are gonna help, but um, that, that's only a partial solution. You, you're gonna need active dew heating, I think, um, in extreme scenarios. The first question is, could you use peel and stick foil duct tape? And the second question is, should you build a heated eyepiece case? So, um, uh, those are good questions. Um, the, uh, the, um, when I was thinking about the foil, the reflective foil, which I actually put inside my um, uh, custom heater, uh, I did think about uh, aluminum duct tape um, with the sticky backing on it. So that that's an alternative, uh, and I think that would work fine. Um, the the uh, the way I built it is the reflector where I put the foil was on the outside of the outer perimeter of the heater. And if I use the aluminum sticky tape, then the sticky bit is sticking out um, there. So if you just accommodated for that in your design, that sounds fine to me. I think that would work. So uh, that was on my list of supplies when I was thinking about building this. Do I use aluminum foil or do I use aluminum duct tape? Um, and I, I went with foil. Uh, and I yeah, that's a that's a great idea. One of these days, I'll build one of those. Um, uh, uh, what what I sort of do, I have a, my eyepiece case, and if I'm out in the open somewhere, um, I make a point of closing the lid. I know lots of people; they set up all their gear, and I many a time I see eyepieces cases sitting open um, in a high humidity situation, and I I think you're again you're asking for trouble there. I, I closed the lid. I have a towel in there and so on. Now, one, one day when I was in an electronic shop, I found a sheet, uh, a, 
some sort of heating element sheet. I don't know what it's used for. Um, it was just this raw sheet, um, and, and it was about 12 inches by 12 inches, wires coming off of it. I hooked it up to 12 volts. It got warm. Uh, so I thought, I, and I, I went, this is great. I bought two of them, and I've never, ever used it for anything. But that would be maybe a nice thing to build, build into a case or maybe just slip inside um, the cover. And uh, it's, it's got plastic coating on it. It's all sort of insulated. So, so that would keep the eyepieces warm. Uh, so so that, that's a, sort of a neat idea, heating right inside the uh, eyepiece case or uh, having some sort of active element inside the case would be good. But in, in lieu of that, if you're observing, don't leave your eyepiece case open. Um, as Eric suggests, put all your caps and covers on your eyepieces when you're not using them. Um, many, again, many a time I see people observing and they take one eyepiece out of the telescope, put it on the table, switch to another eyepiece, and it's out in the open. So that eyepiece will get dewed up um, just sitting there. If nothing else, you just need to cover it with with something. Um, so it, the the you know it's not sort of out in the sky in the open air. No more questions in the chat. Questions? Okay. You're okay, good. thanks for your time. So Blake, to this day, I still don't have a, a, a dew heater for my eyepieces. And just a very quick story. A few years ago, I was observing at Starfest uh, late August with a Dobsonian telescope. And as you mentioned, you typically don't need uh, dew prevention on a, uh, a daub. And sure enough, uh, my eyepiece uh, dewed up pretty badly and I was I was thought I was out of business. I was done because I didn't have a source of heat to defog the eyepieces. But then it occurred to me that I was running a laptop. So I used <laughs> the laptop's exhaust yeah. to slowly defog the eyepiece. Yeah. And that worked just fine. So I kept, I kept going. <laughs> we, we do <laughs> what we got to do. Cluster. So Star, Starfest, for people that don't know, big star party that happens near Mount Forest in Ontario and typically in July or August. So pr prime time sort of weather conditions where it's really hot in the day and then it cools off dramatically in the evening. And invariably the temperatures get very close to the dew point every evening. I, I look at that when I am planning an observing session. What's the, what's the temperature now sort of in the early evening? What's the humidity right now? Um, what's the predicted dew point? A uh, good astronomy websites, uh, weather websites like Astrospheric um, show you the dew point and how close the ambient air temperature is getting to that. And if you're within two or three degrees of the dew point, dew is going to start to form. It, it doesn't happen only at the dew point. Dew is starting to form um, before that. And, and by, by the time you're at 90, 95% humidity, if you don't have any sort of heating, uh, or a hair dryer, or you know, some warm pockets. Um, you you could be done. When when I started observing, that the store didn't tell me about this. I, I'd blow my budget anyway. But the, uh, the store didn't tell me um, when I bought my telescope. You uh, think about dew heating. So I just assumed because I was on my own, didn't talk to anybody. I just assumed that if you did astronomy, you you could only do it for an hour. And then you'd pack up and go home. Uh, so, so that's what I did for the first couple of years. And then I started thinking, there's got to be, you know, go for a longer period, longer observing sessions. I'm here, and I started learning about the uh, passive and active dew strategies. So I got the dew cap. That was the first thing that I got, and that only helped to a degree. And then I started getting dew heaters. And, and that was night and day um, that that it just made the whole evening uh, available. So hopefully this has given you some ideas. Very good. Thank you so much, Blake. Welcome. Excellent presentation as always. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Dennis Gray. He'll talk to us about rapid polar alignment uh, with uh, sharp cap, but uh, please give us a moment to get him set up and we'll be right back.
we're back and uh, Dennis Gray is ready to go to tell us about uh, SharpCat. Great, thank you very much, Paul. And uh, welcome to my little uh, interesting presentation. This presentation is um, uh, kind of an example of a stumble upon kind of presentation where uh, I uh, found this feature and uh, wasn't really expecting to find it. I'll explain a little bit behind that story, but. Uh, but uh, I was excited and uh, and it makes a good presentation and I think it's kind of a unique take on an old problem that I think we all share. So just in terms of what uh, we're going to talk about, uh, I'll talk about uh, what is SharpCap, what is, uh, wh where does it fit in the pantheon of imaging software out there. Uh, I'll talk, show my, a little bit about my particular polar alignment challenge when I'm observing from my backyard and my deck in downtown Toronto. Uh, and then I'll uh, just, uh, we'll show a video and annotate and talk about that and I'll go through the polar alignment process. Should take about uh, half an hour, so I'm sure that'll be fine. And uh, cover off some key points and hopefully some Q&A will follow. So what is SharpCap? Well, SharpCap <clears throat> is uh, image capture software for images and videos. It's been around for about 10 years now. It's uh, started in 2010. And the author uh, seems to be a very nice fellow by the name of Robin Glover, and uh, he's uh, running his own website over in the UK, sharptap.co.uk. And um, the, the software is developed over a fair bit of time, but it initially focused on sort of high frame rate image capture, or in other words, Lockheed imaging or planetary, what we would think of as planetary imaging. The software is developed over time. So on his own website, he talks a little bit about the history here, and I was interested because he was talking about his frustrations with AMCAP. How, I'm not sure, I'm sure a few of us remember AMCAP. So when video cameras were first coming out and first being applied for astronomical imaging and taking pictures of planetary uh, targets and then using things like Registack to sharpen them up and bring them up, AMCAP was sort of like your very, very basic uh, software that could be used to, to uh, work with things. And he talks about some of the problems here and. Uh, and because he was a software developer, naturally his solution is not to complain, his solution is to actually go and build one himself. And so that's what he's done, and that's where uh, uh, SharpCap has come from. Now, I noticed here that he you know, he got a, uh, a link from Bassler Cameras, never heard of Bassler Cameras, but Bassler Cameras um, asked him would, they support, would he support their cameras. So it was a bit of a partnership with a uh, software uh, camera company that sort of got him into the business and got him developing this particular uh, imaging software. So currently um, there is a, a reasonable selection of cameras that are supported here um, and you can see that most of these cameras are what I would call high frame rate cameras like cameras that are designed to take more video type um, uh, pictures ra rather than long exposure cameras like uh, say an SBIG or uh, something like that but it doesn't mean that these cameras aren't also capable of taking long exposures. So uh, in its present form, uh, SharpCap can take, uh, do a very, very credible job of working with video type um, um, uh, imaging, whereas the, um, um, uh, but you can also take like a, a 30 second or a two minute exposure as long as the camera supports it. So that, that, uh, that's a fairly uh, broad range of cameras that's there. So why did I end up using SharpCap? Well, for those of you that remember my uh, earlier presentation about the uh, QHY 174 GPS camera, it's the only imaging product out there in the market that works with the QHY 174M. So, um, uh, you know, back to the, the, the thing, he has a partnership with QHY where he is w actively working on adjusting his software in order to work with the API and the toolkit that comes to the camera. And that camera is the only one in the market that has the ability to embed a GPS timestamp on the frame. And used, because the camera uses USB 3.0 technology and the fast uh, throughput available on both the camera and the USB 3.0 uh, connection, uh, you're able to take video, astronomical video, and, and convert it directly to digital. And then when you add that GPS timestamp, you've got what you need for occultation astronomy where that timestamp plus sensitivity and, and uh, time resolution is very important. Um, so uh, why occultation? So I was talking about um, 
why my particular interest in occultations and uh, you know just the sense that um, astronomy has a lot of different branches. We have observational astronomy, photography, um, double star studies, um, variable star studies, and so on. But occultations is a, is a little sub branch that that studies um, uh, the uh, passage of, of objects in space in front of stars and learns a lot about the objects in space as well as the stars as a result. So one of the things that um, um, that you know you would see here is a star. Uh, from, as seen from Earth, uh, an asteroid passes in front of it, and then a group of astronomers all working together uh, time that, the time of that disappearance. And when we integrate that information, we can determine the exact size of the asteroid and also its rough shape. And that information combined with the ability uh, to understand the, star, the asteroid spectrum and other, other features of it means that we're able to, you know, essentially get a much better understanding of that asteroid, figure out whether it's a freshly broken off piece uh, of an asteroid that uh, used to be part of Vesta, or perhaps it's a primordial off, uh, asteroid that has um, uh, been around since the beginning of the solar system. And that makes a big difference uh, for, for how things are done. My particular um, uh, imaging setup here for occultations, which is where we're using this, is I have a Vixen uh, Great Polaris mount using SynScan and EQMod for GoTo. Um, I use an 8 inch Schmidt Castigrain with Fast Star, which takes the focal length of my uh, SCT down from uh, about 2,000 millimeters down to 430 something, uh, which gives me a much uh, nice wide field of view, but I still have 8 inches of aperture to, to gather starlight with. The afor aforementioned GPS camera, uh, the Sky X is driving it, and of course, SharpCap is the imaging software. So this is uh, a little bit of a uh, view from the north of the north of my preferred uh, observing location. I have a deck in my backyard which uh, is sheltered and uh, private and everything. So I do like to observe from there, but this uh, local Norway maple has been getting uh, more and more in my way as time has been going on. So it's I've given some thought as to how to deal with it. One thought it involves getting out in the middle of the night with a chainsaw, um, but this, uh, this solution seems a little bit more elegant and uh, hopefully is going to be something that I can work with. So this is uh, what we're trying to, to work around essentially is this tree. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna give a demonstration of Monday night's uh, setup here. And I'll start with um, uh, the, the overall process and uh, I'll show you this in real time. This is really how it went and uh, we'll uh, have a chance to observe and I'll comment as we go along. So I started first by uh, uh, launching uh, SharpCap here. And SharpCap software comes up on my laptop here. So it has a helpful, you know, tips on startup feature, which I kind of like. Uh, and I go and check the polar alignment and I realize it's not working. So I have to go and connect my camera. Uh, the camera, once it's connected, is uh, working, but it needs to have its profile adjusted. So the profile essentially is a settings uh, of, of gain, uh, bit rates, frame size, and everything else like that that brings up a particular framework for occultation related work. So once I set my settings here, I've got uh, a star field that I can work with and I start the polar alignment routine. So the polar alignment routine shows up here at the bottom of the screen and it gives you some pretty nice step-by-step -step instructions. There's a skip the uh, introduction op option so you can turn it off if you don't need to read it all. But essentially this is saying, and this is quite interesting, is that if I just have a little guide scope with a guide camera, I can do this polar alignment as well. So you don't need the sharp cap, you just need a, a guide scope that happens there. So step one is it's going to go out and capture its first image. This is a reference image. And it's going to take that reference image and start plate solving that image right away. So it's going to do a plate solve process. And you can see here it's completed the plate solve it's given me my exact field of view. It's identified 103 stars in the image. It's used 15 of them. Uh, it's identified my pixel size, and it's identified exactly where we are in the sky, the center RA and center deck. And then the next step is to rotate the RA axis. So I'm going to now take, unhook my scope, and I'm going to manually move it through 90 degrees and reorient the scope while uh, essentially moving things around. So you can see the stars are spinning here uh, and at no point 
and and we're still seeing lots of stars because the sensitivity of the camera is set up there so once that settles down i'm in now in the position now to take the next picture and it automatically starts to take the second frame so you see here first frame second frame and it's working and it's doing its calculation so it's got 103 stars it's picked 15 of them and it's working through this uh, process of solving this uh, second image that it's taking and we're seeing some no uh, we're also seeing these green lines which indicate roughly where it is and now it's solved the the problem it's done the math and it's solved the problem and it's telling me my pole or alignment is poor. Well, that's not a surprise at all. But now what I've got here is I've got this immediate feedback saying, I've got to move it down and I've got to move it right. And this is measured in terms of uh, degrees, uh, minutes and seconds of uh, you know, uh, working there. And what's interesting, you can see on the display this little yellow line that's going on here. And what's happening with a little yellow line is it's picking stars and it's showing the distance between the target, which is here, and the, the star. So, but it's constantly, as it gets new images, it's, it's working with different stars. And you can see the length of my little yellow lines is getting shorter and shorter as I get closer and closer to my polar alignment. So in real time, it's getting quite there, quite small. I can see Polaris has just come into my field of view which kind of makes sense because Polaris is quite close to the North Celestial Pole and you can see right there that it is. And my polar alignment error has now reached the point of being fair. It's not so bad anymore. That's good. And uh, I can still do a few further adjustments here. And then I reach good. And you can see my two little yellow lines there are very close together and it settles down. Still uh, bouncing around a little bit, but it's checking the alignment there. There's Polaris, there's the North Celestial Pole, and I am done. And so there we go. Um, <clears throat> I could now turn off the polar alignment and now I'm ready to complete my uh, st star alignment and continue with the rest of my observing session. That's it, that's the demo. So let's just uh, recap a little slower what went on there. So, so in the software itself, uh, it has embedded in it a, a um, plate solving set of all of the stars that surround the North Pole. So uh, in the current version, the, the star map is about seven degrees outside of, the, outside of the pole. So all you have to do is basically um, get within that seven degree circle and it will be able to plate solve for you. The other thing that we are doing here is we, you know, that's the imaging uh, size of my, my chip there. So I'm roughly somewhere in that circle and then it's able to go through its polar alignment process. So the author, Robin Glover, credits uh, Themos Tsitsikas, who came up with this idea originally, the polar, uh, photopolar align, he called it, and he helped him integrate it into his software. So that's, uh, that's great. So essentially what's going on is when we rotate that telescope through the 90 degrees, uh, we do the plate saw, we know exactly where the mount is pointing, and from that we know where the celestial pole is. And then the second picture tells us where the center of rotation of the mount is, in other words, where it should be pointing. And then the animation is just to help us line up that center of rotation with the pole. Now, you might have noticed that my lines were a little off uh, in angle there, and that's because, unbeknownst to me, when I did this demo, my mount was not uh, well suited. It was a little bit on an angle. I still got polar alignment, but it would have been even easier if I started with my mouth actually horizontal instead of sort of off off, uh, off base. Um, so in terms of some of the um, guidance that was given by uh, Robin, uh, he's saying don't go for zero. A lot of people, you can spend your whole life trying to get it down to zero, but what, basically when it says good when you're within one arc minute, that's fine for most imaging. So there's a temptation to go go too far with it, but you don't want to do it. Um, it's uh, the documentation uh, mentioned that he's increased his um, star map to seven degrees of the pole, uh, and the camera has to be able to see at least 10 to 15 stars. Now, my camera with its sensitivity was giving it lots of options, maybe too many, uh, but but essentially that was a, that, that's all they needs to do the plate solving. And there's lots of good documentation on the SharpCap website about how to do that and exactly how the polar alignment routine works. Um, as an imaging solution, uh, you know, so so one of the questions is, would 
assignment or would you use it for general imaging? Um, you can get a free version. There's a freely available download version. Um, so if you like it and you want to see if you like it as an imaging software, you certainly can do that. And you can certainly confirm if it's going to work with your camera or not. Um, I don't know if it would necessarily replace or supplant your existing imaging software, um, but it, it would be um, potentially a nice thing even if you just did this particular part of it uh, with it. Um, the pro version is needed to get the polar alignment routine included and it's available for $19 a year. So it's not a lot of money. Um, and uh, whether or not uh, all of the features of it as an imaging software and all of the different options and gain controls, and GPS controls and so on, we'll hold that over for another presentation at another time. Uh, but we just wanted to focus on this. So this is, uh, this is roughly where I ended up with my first alignment star after everything was done and I'll throw it open to some questions from the, from the audience. No questions for Dennis, really? Unfortunately, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, one question I might ask, however, is did you find any learning curve um, getting used to the software or was it pretty intuitive? Overall, the, the software I found it was, um, there was a bit of a learning curve and most of the learning curve was related to just um, playing around with the controls and getting to know them better. Uh, and also there's some there's a particular set of learning curve around the GPS software, uh, which has been getting a lot better. He's been he's been moving it forward and, al and aligning it. And these funny numbers here have a lot to do with that. So essentially getting the GPS to work reliably depends on the camera working reliably in a weird, wonderful way. Uh, but it's got good control over exposures. You can be very, very granular about how long an exposure you want to take. The frame rate, you can control that and you're also able to control the gain uh, on the camera. So you can really um, you know, take what looks like nothing and get a lot of stars out of it. So that's, it's, it's not bad, but I would say, you know, your mileage will, uh, will vary um, if, you know, and I would say, use the free version, uh, get, see if you like it. And then if you like it, then I'd say it's definitely worth the $19 to get the extra features. Yeah. Go ahead, Blake. Um, so thanks, I have a question. Um, in the past, I remember that for your occultation rig, you had a, uh, a Stellacam mm -hmm. uh, did your actual image acquisition. Um, so I, I gather you're using this new camera now and have you used SharpCap uh, to capture the asteroid occultation event uh, video? Um, I haven't had a chance to, to do that yet. <laughs> I promised Paul I would come back and show him as soon as I had a chance to uh, get one of those and I'm still working on it. Um, it it's been a dry season for getting the, the, the right combination of clear sky, uh, reasonably bright star, um, appropriate uh, height above the horizon, uh, reasonable bedtime, et cetera, et cetera. So I haven't had uh, much luck in terms of getting that, but as soon as I get one, I will be back to share. Uh, how it goes. My other occulting rig, which is uh, analog system using digital uh, overlay of uh, GPS timestamps, that's still around, I, can, I still have it. Um, <clears throat> but this is uh, hope, hopefully going to be a much more elegant uh, solution um, and, and allow me to reduce the amount of equipment that I have to take out to the field. So essentially, instead of having to bring a whole suitcase full of occultation related timing stuff. Uh, I just need one camera and one computer now, so that makes me happier. Okay, we have some additional questions online. Chris Vaughn asks, would it work near a street lamp post? Um, the software, sh well, sure, it, it would. Um, you would want to obviously shade the um, the overall um, aperture to make sure that you didn't get any direct light in your in your path. But there's no reason why, you know, it shouldn't be able to intensify the image enough to <clears throat> pull. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, I've been imaging uh, deep sky objects from my backyard. So I've been looking at things like M13 and M27 and other other bright deep sky objects from Toronto, downtown Toronto, and I'm able to see them on my computer screen 
with uh, you know reasonable um, gain settings and so forth. So that's been that's uh, that's a nice bonus of this, uh, and it is like I say able to go much. I find it's able to go much deeper than my old uh, cultivation rig for sure. So it's it's fighting light pollution <clears throat> uh, reasonably well, Chris. Other questions? Eric Briggs uh, mentions, I don't see CD guide yet, and I have noticed my mount trying to drift a line if I'm not very close. Keeping images below 30 seconds, it still helps to get it right. Okay, um, I didn't quite follow the question there. Mario Gagnon mentions, uh, not a question, but rather a comment. Oh, I, I found the numbers. Yeah. I found the numbers were different whether I rotated left or right. And I assume it is because my guide scope is not properly aligned. Correct. Um, it shouldn't matter. I don't think it should matter. I think the what it's trying to do, <clears throat> it's finding the axis of rotation of the whole mount. And whether they, the guide scope is, is fully aligned or not shouldn't matter because the uh, axis of rotation of the scope should be the same. Uh, if you're on, on axis or a little off axis, it shouldn't matter. Uh, yes, we had uh, Eric's comment rather, rather than more than a question. And I think that's everything in the chat. Okay, very good. That is, thank you so much for bringing this to our attention. Uh, I've heard of SharpCap, but I did not know that they had a, a polar alignment uh, uh, feature available. That's fantastic. Great. All Thanks right. Thanks very much, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Cheers. For sure. Thank you. Good. So uh, that wraps up the speakers for this evening. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Arnold, Blake, and Dennis uh, for their presentations. And uh, next, we're going to move on to Ralph Chu, our president, to um, deliver the announcements for this evening. Give us a moment to set, set him up, and we'll be right back. We're back and Ralph, over to you for the announcements. Okay, thank you, Paul. Well, I'll start by uh, thanking our presenters tonight, Arnold, Blake, and Dennis for uh, a really interesting uh, set of uh, presentations tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, since the sky is clear, I will go quickly through the announcements so we can get outside and enjoy the clear, warm sky tonight. Uh, let's just take a look at what's uh, up at our next meeting, which will be on July 15th. Uh, another recreational astronomy night online for us. Uh, the world famous TBD is back uh, with the sky this month, uh, followed by David Robitaille uh, imaging from the backyard. Artash Nath is going to present on uh, the role of seismic vibrations, measuring them, and uh, the impact of the COVID-19 lockdown. That's going to be an interesting connection to make. And then Frank Dempsey is going to give us a report on uh, his progress on uh, building a 12 and a half inch telescope. So that again, Wednesday, July 15th at 7.30 p.m. on our YouTube channel. Uh, a reminder that um, you know we are uh, looking 
uh, at this point at uh, resuming our speakers nights program in September. And uh, we do have a speaker lined up, uh, whether it's online or in person really depends on whether the Science Center opens uh, to the public. Uh, for the moment, we're planning it uh, to be an online presentation on exoplanets presented by uh, Elisa Obertus, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto. So we'll uh, be updating you on that as we get closer to that date. Uh, just a reminder that uh, even though most of the province has uh, now gone back to uh, almost normal with uh, moving to stage two, uh, we are still uh, suspending our education and public outreach activities at all of our uh, normal locations um, until such time as we can make appropriate arrangements to uh, uh, carry on. So um, again, just one of the uh, casualties of the uh, emergency orders. Similarly, all of our uh, members only and public observing uh, events continue to be suspended under stage two of the um, emergency. Uh, remember that uh, the society uh, on its YouTube channel has a number of different uh, programs that it's offering online to members and the public. And uh, particularly, there is the speaker series online, uh, which has some interesting talks. And uh, I encourage you to take a look at that. Also, uh, we've uh, had uh, some news that the Halifax Center is putting uh, uh, presentations from the uh, General Assembly that they hosted in 2015 online. They've had a, a bit of a problem with uh, funding and uh, uh, personal resources in uh, processing the video files from the General Assembly. They just got that uh, underway during the uh, uh, pandemic shutdown, and they're now starting to deploy those uh, videos on their uh, YouTube channel. So if you take a look at Halifax Center RESC on YouTube, uh, you should be able to find those uh, particular presentations. Uh, the CAO uh, is still closed, although uh, I can tell you that there's been a lot of activity uh, by the CAO committee to uh, make preparations for reopening it on a very limited basis. Um, and uh, Ian Wheelband will be uh, uh, announcing the arrangements uh, in the not too distant future, I expect. Um, there's been a lot of work uh, in addition to just uh, the regular maintenance and cutting the grass on the property uh, for the last um, uh, several weeks. Uh, the committee is working on uh, uh, making changes to the uh, uh, layout in the house and on the observing pad uh, on the grounds and uh, looking at how we can uh, once again resume observing activity on the site uh, and um, uh, again uh, once we uh, move to stage two in the gta uh, i think then uh, it'll be possible for people to uh, go up to the cao site uh, with a clear conscience and uh, uh, we will be uh, looking at a reopening sometime in the next uh, few weeks. Uh, and again, uh, watch on the email forum, um, as well as for information at our next online uh, meeting about what happens with the CAO. Uh, I think that's everything for now. Uh, we are uh, just uh, waiting to uh, see how much of our uh, classical programming can be resumed. Uh, there's a lot of things that we have to think about in terms of uh, uh, minimizing uh, transmission of the coronavirus uh, at the telescope and so on. And these are very important things to uh, consider before we can actually uh, resume any of our uh, activities. But uh, please be assured that we are uh, actively pursuing all of these things 
and uh, looking to resume our programs as quickly as we can. Uh, if you have any concerns or questions, please feel free to contact me uh, through email at president at raskto.ca. I'm happy to answer your questions and um, hopefully things will uh, start uh, coming back um, in the next few weeks. So that's it for the announcements now. Thank you very much for tuning in tonight. Uh, I wish you health and clear skies. Uh, go enjoy that sky tonight and we'll see you back here at our July uh, Recreational Astronomy uh, Night online. Good night, everybody. See you again.